I set it up so that it was um, And um, it's really, I mean, it's the best thing about seeing it later, you know, things. It's lots of cloud making it really good. Like, we had like a really good, I mean, this, this is a very good recommendation, but um, we're doing the best with our business. So. She feels guilty, and I, she can't keep doing it. I don't. I, I don't know what can be done. At this point, so. I try to drop little hints, but I can't say too much. I was I'm actually doing. By the way, she's gonna continue to fail. You know, keep failing. Yeah. I, I realized that. I didn't. I mean, Kimmy, I feel like it might have been. But not be any longer than three weeks at one point, so. Who knows? Yeah. 
Ja, gestern. But, yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. Are you guys doing anything for um, for Tuesday at all? Or? Is that this Tuesday? It's this Tuesday, yeah. That Tuesday? Is that Tuesday, 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 Tuesday. I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure. Okay. Just plan on coming over, I'm sure. I might, I might try to come over. Yeah. I, if you can. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Generous Companies Gumbo. This is our second year here at Theater Project doing this festival of works in various stages of development. Uh, it's a time for a lot of people to check in with their ideas. Uh, people don't get the opportunity to do that very much uh, as artists. We're all focused on trying to get it perfect before we allow anyone to see it. And this festival sort of throws that aside and allows us to put something out there that is not done, is declared not done. Share it with an audience, have a conversation, break some bread, have a beer, talk about it, get some ideas, and then we can move forward. Uh, that's sort of the whole premise of what we're doing here in, in these two weeks. Uh, there's a lot of information that I'm going to have to deliver to you, but I'm going to do it over several different speeches throughout the evening so I don't overwhelm you at once. This document has a lot of great stuff in it. It's all about what we've been doing, what we've been working on, everything that's happened over two weeks. Please check it out in your free time. Um, the first act you're going to see tonight is going to be readings of three new plays. Uh, our theme this year for Gumbo was Art and the Brain. We got uh, really fascinated by these uh, new ideas in neurobiology and how the brain perceives art and why the brain perceives art, and sort of took a challenge to ourselves and sent the challenge out to a lot of WordBridge playwrights. Uh, WordBridge Playwrights Laboratory is another program we run. Uh, and 18 of our playwrights responded and wrote new plays in one month, and what you're gonna hear tonight is the first time these words have ever been spoken in front of an audience. Uh, so they're very raw, very new, and all of them are moving forward. Um, tonight we have Parliament of the Mind, uh, by Antoinette Nwandu. We have The Trolley Problem by Stephanie Swirsky and Cartographer's Dream by Dipika Guha. Uh, I want to ask you all to turn off your cell phones. I want to remind you that in case of an emergency, the doors you came in also work the other way. Uh, don't go that way, it's not gonna end well. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Everything we do here is uh, by donation only. It's just pass the hat, pay what you can, pay what you think it's worth. Uh, we hope you think it's worth something. When you pass one of my lovely assistants carrying sombreros out there, if you like what you see, throw us a couple of bucks. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'll see you. The word bridge players. <laughs> First playwright this evening is Stephanie Swirsky. Her plays have been developed or produced at the Brick Theater, the Fleet Theater, Theatricum Botanicum, and Wordbridge, among others. She received her BA from New York University and her MFA in Dramatic Writing from the University of Southern California. The Trolley Problem by Stephanie Swirsky. Characters Leah, 22, Max, 20, and Yuri, 20. We are in a dorm room. Leah and Max are studying. So, there's a trolley headed towards five people. And the only way to save these people is to hit a switch that would divert the trolley to a different lane where only one person is. And so, only one person dies. What do you do? Yeah, watch out! You can only hit the switch for now. You're mute. Pretend you're mute. Oh, raise my hand. 
and light. You're not anywhere near them. You're far, far away. You can hit the switch or not. You told me you wanted to know what I'm studying. Hit the switch so it goes light. What asshole kills the fox? No one. That's the point. That's the whole thing? That's easy peasy. Can I take this class? <laughs> that isn't it. Always more than the meets the eye. Not for you. <laughs> oh, what? I like simple guys. Like you. Where do I find this trolley? Okay. So there's another trolley. And this time the trolley is headed towards five people. And the only way to stop the trolley from killing the people, the only way, only, 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 yes, the only way is to push this guy on a bridge over and onto the track. The trolley will run over the guy and save the other people. How big is this guy? <laughs> I thought he sounds like a fat, like trolley sounds. Yeah, next time I see a fat guy, I'm going to be like, no, there goes the trolley. Or not. Push him or do nothing. Yeah, push him. Stop the trolley. Boom, I'm a hero. You push the guy. <laughs> you push the guy. Why is this so shocking to you? You just answer him so quickly. It's pretty simple. Five lives for one. But you're pushing him. It's not a switch you're pressing. I know. Pick picture the guy, okay? Picture someone. You were in the Israeli army. Why is this so shocking to you? Picture the guy. Seriously, close your eyes and picture him on the bridge with you. Hey, 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 hey. I'll do it too. You kill him first. You can't trust me? Max relents. He closes his eyes, and Leah closes hers too. So you're on a bridge with this guy. Fury, a smooth and straight to the point Israeli soldier comes on and plays with his gun. You see him? I can see him. Yes, and there's this magical calm over him, like he knows he's going to meet his maker. Uh, you're also kind of nice. Just imagine being up there and sending him to his death. Yuri is standing watch. He's a guard, but he can still move around. It can get boring after all. Didn't you make this as each individual life is? Max opens his eyes. Yes, each individual. So how much more do five lives mean? That's four lives. What are you doing? I just need to study. You're distracting me. You're being fucking weird. Push the guy and watch the other five people. It's just that these psychopaths before that they realized they couldn't just push a guy a fucking trolley tooting its horn below. You of all people should know that you don't really know what you're going to do until you do. You push that guy. I wouldn't. You never made that kind of decision real time in the army? Why else would an American go into the Israeli army? Just stop. To make those fucking tough decisions and figure out what's what. Figure out what's what. Why are you even taking this so seriously? So, I'm a crazy psychopath. Tell me something I didn't know. I won't push the guy. Me I'm good with taking orders. <coughs> no. I know. I know. I'm just serious for my own good. I'm sorry. What? No. What? No. What? <laughs> Look into my eyes. Are these the eyes of a crazy person? What can I say? We learn new things about each other every day. Oh, I already knew that. Leah and Max read. Or try to. Is it top secret? You're making me feel top secret by not telling me. We've been dating a month. Is it really that big of a deal? 
Guard. Just guard. Cool. What did you guard? Israel. <laughs> the whole country. Are you about to start me now? I didn't realize how big and powerful you are. Are? Are? You're on reserve duty? <laughs> I don't get the big deal. One life, logical. Honestly, I think even hitting the switch in the first scenario is hard. Don't think so hard about it. <laughs> You're like those dudes in England. I'm totally in England. Here's if anything can number team four. Hard to remember that. Yeah, that's how I felt when I went to high school. It's pretty amazing. Such a lie, though. You know? What you did, that was real. Never felt real. Sand from this big tall tower. You make things fun or tolerable. The last couple of months I was with her, I can't think. surprise you anymore. Yeah. There's nothing out there until she met a different soldier and then. So he goes to Leah's church. So he's trying to show, as you say. <laughs> and that. Why are you laughing? I feel weird. I'm purposely ignoring your story because if you hook up with someone else. Then we went. Am I doing something? I told him I wasn't keeping it. All right. Babies fuck things up. I'm doing something here in the army. I didn't know what I was saying, and he was like. You don't want to stay here in Israel after. It's okay. The safe. He hardly spoke to me in Hebrew, everyone else did, but he said he liked me because he could practice with me, and I felt more comfortable speaking in English, too. You're even you being pregnant. I was just so stressed out that I stopped having my period. Sometimes I wish I could tell her I thought I was. You're Elise. Leah looks at the screen. I saw this Palestinian girl, probably my age, running. And I put my hand on the screen. And I imagined that she could feel my hand on her shoulder and said, it's going to be okay. My hand smothered her entire body on that screen, but you know, like that. I don't know. I mean, I knew what happens could happen, but, but I didn't. I, I thought I did. But when I got there, I realized I knew nothing at all. It was a total fucking waste. We did good job. I just stood there. Were you supposed to shoot someone? Report. That's all. I was really supposed to do. It does sound like you could be boring. I think. I think if I was running the trolley, five people would die each time because I couldn't make a stupid decision. Do you want a drink? Not really. Yuri Anders. You back? I know. You're a psychopath. Try hard not to be, but sometimes it just spills out. Actually, you know, that's what they say in class. Uh, the, the professor says that psychopaths, they try to act normal. They work really hard at it, actually. The ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, which works with emotional responses, they both don't work. They don't work right, so I guess psychopaths can't understand emotional triggers. But I guess they can learn it or figure it out. And seem totally normal, but sometimes all that thinking misfires, and then they end up acting like an asshole. I guess we're both crazy. She takes it, no, but then you do. That's what I've learned about you. I'm kidding. And She is a New York-based writer who work has been honored with ACTF's Lorraine Hansberry Clean Writing Award and the NEC's Douglas Turner Award, of Pri Award Prize. Her plays have been produced and developed by the Movement Theater Company, Wordbridge Playwrights Laboratory, Dreamscape Theater, By This Time, and the Monarch Theater Company. She is a member of the Dramatists Guild. Parliament of the Mind, or Clara versus the Skydive. The Breakdown. Judge Willpower, male, British, old, a stuffy judge who peers down over his spectacles, wears a powdered wig, represents the part of Clara's brain that gives her willpower. Barney Reason, male, nervous when he doesn't, represents the part of Clara's brain that formulates her reason. 
Mr. Gigglepant, male, young, portly, a man child with a blankie, wears a tomb, curly, unkempt hair, has a habit of raising his hand when he speaks, but neither is brain responsible for emotion. And written with red fire hair, she wears an emerald green dress and no <coughs> shoes. She is Clara's soul. And minutes before the jump. Signs over today's proceedings. All this session of the Parliament of the Mind, all things logical and rational in order. We're more than ready, Your Honor. And Mr. Giggle Pants, how goes the case for the emotion? I just want to say, I love you guys so much. <laughs> that won't be necessary. Now, it seems as though we have got a new decision. In the case of, oh good heavens, Clara v. the Skydive. General sounds of murmuring from the court. Order! Order right this instant, all of you, before I throw you out, and I mean you, instinct and motor skills. We'll have no more outbursts from anyone. <laughs> all right now, Barney, what's all this nonsense about? Thank you, Judge. I'll do my best to present the facts, and only the facts. Two weeks ago, a certain male that we'll call K. Ooh, oh, that stands for Kevin. Yes, GG. No. <laughs> <coughs> so, why not call him Kevin? It's a really nice first name, because we need to keep our heads about us if we want to make a reasonable decision in this case. We'll stick to nothing but the facts. K stands for Kevin is a fact, an awesome fact. Professor, please continue. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Two weeks ago, Kevin invited our dear Clara, and therefore us, on what some might call a rather unusual outing. Fun! I, I call it fun. He asked us to go skydive. And have we done this sort of thing before? No, Judge. We most certainly have not. No, so we did say to Kevin, and I quote, <coughs> I've always wanted to be more adventurous, end quote. <laughs> and then we did that thing we sometimes do that reads as flirty. Be that as it may, <laughs> the fact remains that a decision must be made. Do we say yes to this excursion, which, I might remind the court, is both expensive and unsafe? He said he'd pay. What's that, GP? Speak up. <clears throat> it's just that Kevin said he'd pay. His cousin stepmom, his cousin stepmom owns the place or something, and we wouldn't jump alone. They have these harness things, and then they, they are, I don't know, they sort of strap him to an expert. That sounds so reassuring. Come on, guys. Pretty soon we're going to graduate and college life will end, and then it's real world problems. Let's just have a little no more before that gets here. May I remind the court that in a vacuum, bodies like the one I hope we're all trying to protect are bound by laws of science to accelerate at 32 feet per second every second. And that's without the resistance from the wind or how high up the plane will be or whether someone still inside will have to push us. Given all these facts, I hardly think <laughs> soul fire enters the chambers as though she's been running for a long time. What the hell is taking you so long? A huge swell of murmuring in the court. For order! Order! My good woman, these are private proceedings in the mind of Clara. Who exactly are you? I'm Clara's self. Her total self. Of the, that poets write about and that pictures try to capture. I'm her soul. <laughs> okay, I give up. Somebody wake me up when we get back to the business of making informed decisions. All this.
Yes, yes. I wondered when those ugly truths would rear their heads. Judge Wilhelm, with all due respect, in each of these previous cases of this nature, you sided with my opponent and the unabashed emotion he is here to represent. We plunged headlong into relationships that were, to put it mildly, disastrous. Exhibit A, the drummer. Oh, come on, that was a phase! You know his leather jacket smelled like anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> and then he broke our heart. Exhibit B, spring fling with that associate professor. He knew so much about the life of that. <laughs> and then he broke our heart. Exhibit C. All right, all right, make it stop. Exhibit C, that deadbeat Steve from high school. Hey, no fair, we haven't seen him in ages. No, but thanks to you, we did send him a couple dozen texts that night last month while we were drunk. <laughs> <laughs> we had some things that we needed to discuss. <laughs> and so, your honor, here all evidence suggests that we must once again rely on reason. Only reason. In the case of Clara versus the skydiver, we must respond to Kevin's rash and irresponsible request with a resounding no. Mr. Gigglepants, do you have a counter argument? We like him. What was that? I said we like him. And we think jumping will be fun. Is that it? Mm -hmm. That's all I got. All right, then. I guess it's up to me now. And I have to deliver it. But it's too late for that. Oh, dear. Where are we now? We're going over the last-minute safety instructions. Yes, but where is Kevin? He's here. He's right next to us. And he's telling us it's going to be okay. He takes our hand. Why, please? <laughs> I at least need to hear the safety instructions. <laughs>
Cartographer's Dream by Deepika Guha. Characters. Actor 1, a surgeon, female, late 30s. Actor 2, a factory worker at a tobacco factory. Actor 3, a dad out of work, mid 40s. Where? A stage. When? Today. Spotlight on surgeon, late 30s, extremely well kept, articulate, with that strange impenetrably of doctors. In impenetrability of doctors who are doing their job. I am a good surgeon because I feel nothing for my patients. <laughs> my slow and sometimes, oh, shall we say, biologically sluggish empathic response has been a tremendous aid to me in my profession. For one, it's a real time saver. Instead of being bogged down by the weighty emotional content of trauma, I can, frankly, just concentrate on the important stuff. I am both in my own estimation and that of others. A remarkable surgeon. Dad comes into life. He's in his mid-40s, average brain, goes to the gym. My son's a hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had no idea this was true until I started to spend more time with him. And then it was something I just kind of noticed. He had these uh, tiny hobbit hands, Oof. tiny sort of hobbity fingers. <laughs> Squat little head. I know he's three, but this looks. <laughs> Brain surgery is sensitive. You know who else is sensitive? My little sister. We had a joke growing up. She felt things, and I did things. Only it wasn't a joke. Because she, well, she gets up for pregnant women on trains. She helps the elderly down the stairs. I barely see pregnant women. Can my sister remove the bones of the skulls and dispose of the brain? No. But she's the only one who invites me to dinner parties every night. And it's funny, you know, because I don't have any hobbit genes in my family. <laughs> I mean, we all look like me, you know? You're a stock average size type human. And so I really worry about it. The more I worry, the smaller you look. <laughs> In my field, they say that to get ahead, you have to be focused and driven, which was handy because I never felt crippled by the need to be nice. It's just not in my makeup to behave like that. In fact, I think niceness is a little manipulative. It's all about provoking the response that you want to get. It is a way our brains have, let's face it, devolved so that we can get what we want from each other without a club to the head. I never understood it. Or, more accurately, I did. I did understand it. I just didn't want it. And as a result, I am the youngest female surgeon at this hospital. And perhaps the only woman in this building who understands that approval is not necessary for your health. But if you do want to invite me to dinner, I will not say no. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized there wasn't any reason to have. It's not a genetic thing. He's just young, age-wise, little guy. And I'd forgotten what I looked like at that age, and you know, I was small too. And so that's my conclusion. <laughs> Children, like hobbits, are small. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes when they eat, they, they eat bad things, they go green. <laughs> so I've heard a tale that in order for the human brain to engage in any kind of storytelling, it needs to know where we are, when we are, and why we're here. Life is large. <coughs> so we draw you a map. A projector turns on a very basic, not to scale map of a small town. And this is a map of the town where this story happens. So that's the where taken care of. There's the main <coughs> rag, here are the stores, here's the hospital, the library, post office, and here, 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 <coughs> and here, that's where everyone lives. Got it? Good. When did our story happen? She clicks the projector and the year 2013 pops up under the map. This year. Why? Life is very large and very confusing. So, we've tried to condense it, condense it down as economically as possible. You need to know that it will all come together because of the artistic aspect of this endeavor. Any questions? Good. So, here's where I will throw in a complication. I am not who I say I am. I have chosen someone else to be my surrogate because 
I have a very large roster of patients, all requiring the most sensitive kinds of brain surgery. And although I have a profound appreciation for the role of the arts, I simply don't have time to participate actively. The actress to be picked to play myself, Sensu stands in front of you speaking these lines, is, you must know, incredibly gifted. <laughs> she has appeared in no less than five episodes of Law and Order and three thrilling episodes of CSI. And she was also incredibly I didn't have to do with the whole casting thing. I had the time, so I thought, why not be here myself? And anyway, I like the idea of telling my own story, so here I am. Spotlight on the woman. She is bright and bubbly, a picture-perfect Hollywood actress. This is my story. You wouldn't know it since uh, I don't come on as much <laughs> <laughs> I had a normal life. I grew up in East Town, graduated from school here. I started my first and uh, only job at the tobacco factory, which I kept for 10 years. Two years ago, I, I started seeing things. But the first time was when I was driving to work. Key in hand, keys in the ignition, pulling down my driveway, on the highway, and suddenly I feel someone touch my right shoulder. There's a lot of noise and people mouthing things to me, you know, behind the windows, and I don't remember pulling onto the hard shoulder. Uh, looking into my mirror, I suddenly see me, you know, age 10, in the back seat. Blue blouse, red polka dot skirt. My skirt is uh, over my head, and there's a man there right next to me, and his hands on my back, my bare hips, and I can't see his face. I scream. And scream, and I must have blacked out because suddenly it's night. Uh, I turn the light on, and uh, the back seat is empty. Uh, there's a car top of the window, and I explain I'm sick. She's kind. Oh, on the way home, I keep checking my mirror, but uh, there's no one there. After that, it started to happen all the time. Images, sometimes whole scenes, uh, everything very precisely. I start to uh, black out everywhere. My body gets limp. A month after the images start, I, I lose my job. It's been the American Night Flutter. It's been a while. I didn't lose my job. Me and my wife was making more money. And, you know, the little guy was getting sick a lot at daycare. I mean, really sick. Tuberculosis sick. Uh, yeah, breathalyzer sick. So it seemed like a good idea. I didn't lose it. I left it. And then they hired someone else, so. And just not the brain surgery, brain tumor surgery, brain aneurysm surgery, bleeding, bleeding brain surgery, meningeal brain surgery, minimally invasive brain surgery. I excel at them all. Sometimes I long for more ranking systems. Because once you've reached the top, it's hard to think about what to do next. The pictures keep coming. I'm here with my legs sticking out of my bed and there's this other body bent over me. Some of the images are in black and white as though it was a time before color. And then one day, while I'm standing in line to pay for groceries, I see this little girl and boy across the aisle fighting each other. They look like siblings. They hit each other with balloons. Maybe there are little balloons in this world every day. And then in a flash, I see me in my bed, and this time his face stares out into the camera of my memory. My father. He was what he did when we were teenagers. We had a beard. I, I hardly remember him with a beard. That face didn't last long. I feel everything fall away from my hands. The last thing I hear is a boom popping and a, a scream of a little girl. I specialize in craniotomies. Sometimes the patient stays awake. And we talk about it. I wonder if they'll invite me to dinner from Sosa. <laughs> we talk, kind of. And he points, and I say the name of things, and he repeats after me. It's kind of like a conversation. <laughs> Sometimes we make animal noises together. He likes that. I took him to the grocery store recently, but he and this little girl hit it off. Well, they, they hit each other. Just balloons, nothing serious, but her mom threatened to sue. It's going just great. 
<laughs> I feel like a part of me is drifting away. During the day, I lose all sense of where I'm standing or sitting, and often wake up in the same place as when you're a roof reminding me that I've been somewhere else. I begin to wish I could be somewhere else, somewhere beyond my memory, beyond my mind, beyond my comprehension, beyond pain. And then I have a brilliant idea. We go to the library. There's a play area there with well-educated children who surely have fewer germs than those ones in the daycare. And I can read and use my festering brain there. I go to the library to uh, look up knowing agents, hoping that something exists in the world that might ease things for me, wipe away the gray white electricity in my brain. It's there in the mind-body section that I find him. Him as my new brother. I go back to the library many times after that. I, I don't want to look up the information online. I want to see it in my hands. So the first time it worked like a treat. Lovely little well read children. We could stay there all day. We got a burger for brunch. I read the paper. He's as happy as can be. And so I decided we'd go there every other day. After meal, he's get in the car and have a little adventure. And I stopped feeling so. You know, uh, obliged to do the housework. My new friend is called Phineas Gage. Phineas sits hard back and bound next to a yellow book called Signs of Intelligence and a purple book about the failure of modern psychology and the biblical alternative. It's a miracle that I found it all. There is a whole chapter dedicated entirely to his brain. Silk hair, chiseled jaw, 200 years younger than I. He is uh, in personality, conscientious, impure. He was standing by a roadbed bed in 1848 when he lost concentration and an iron bar in his hand went completely to the side of his head. His mind, they said, was radically changed. Mm -hmm. So to his friends and acquaintances, he was no longer engaged. I had a choice. I can live like this or I can change myself. I strap him into the back seat. No child car seat, nothing, whatever those damn things are called, too much trouble. Pacifier, music, go. He already has that strange, hobbity, old, wise man smile on his face. <laughs> because he knows where we're going. <laughs> singing together when I hear the explosion. And I don't even think that it's happening to me. But then there's glass in my skin and I look into the back seat and there he is, this little guy with his eyes wide open. I snap my gloves on. Something nags in my head. This feels awfully familiar but I can't tell why. It's soaked in blood. When I see her body sliding into the MRI scan I know her. If we go to college together. All I can do is think about how Mia doesn't know we're here. How we're supposed to be home. Then I realize it's the metal pole. Mia asks me if I'm all right. She hasn't asked me how I am in months. It's always about him and his food and his big hobbit eyes. Phineas Gage. Not in two hundred years has anyone performed this surgery. I am definitely the right person to inherit this case, to conduct a successful surgery, and to rename it after this unfortunate woman. I tell her I'm fine. Surgery is successful. I tell her I've forgotten how to be anything else but fine. She says I'm in shock, but I'm 
Now I'm quite sure I felt like this for years. Touché, okay. First thing I say when I come to is penis. But the nurse is your penis, which they interpret as meaning in the piece, so they give me a back pass. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take her home. I don't know why. She looks like a limpet. Her head is burning hot. Then I search for the old pain in my chest. I can't come back. They wash the street for days. I feel like I'm flying straight off the hospital bed. Trading the water, fend off the new fans. I lose all sense of balance, have seizures, can't speak and can't remember how to count. Someone tells me it's been two years since I walked last. I don't know what two is, but I am still somehow me. Not my voice, not my thoughts. I make her dinner. I buy groceries for the first time in my life, and I make everything from scratch. I bring it to her at the hospital. I sit by her bed. I feed her with salt. Mia and I had dinner together. Without our son. I tell her she looks nice. We eat off the paper plates and throw them out. She's thinking about our son when she's with me. I can't tell. I hold her hand. I dream. I dream of walking down the streets of this town, regal and barefoot. I dream of drowning in clouds. She doesn't know what I say. But I invite her for dinner anyway. She'll be my first dinner guest. I know she might have. I dream of flying over the town, from the post office to the library, the factory, and even the hospital. I look at it from above. I feel it all. The aching potential of my life. A green map of each town filled with light and color. Yeah. I wake. End of play.